explain a little bit about um, who on earth we are. Uh, you've been invited via the uh, Good Services of Totally Legal and their website. Um, we're a partner with them, uh, but a separate business. CV and Interview Advisors is a separate business. Unsurprisingly, given the title, um, we're all about providing uh, people with support for CV writing, professional networking, profile writing, interview coaching, etc., etc. Now, I'm, I'm not wishing to big us or indeed myself up, um, but what I want, do want to do is try and give you the confidence um, in this short space of time that. Uh, what we know about what we do works and has some resonance in the marketplace. We didn't just wake up one morning thinking, wouldn't it be a great idea to spend Wednesday evenings talking to people down a phone line about their CVs. Um, it's, uh, it's an unusual pursuit at the best of times, however useful it may be. Um, but the reality is um, we know our stuff and we know what we do works. Um, in terms of hopefully reinforcing that confidence, my own background, I've employed people, I've been an employer and in recruited people in that classical sense. I've worked in recruitment, both uh, permanent and contract markets, so I've seen it from the other side of the table. Um, I've reviewed tens of thousands of CVs now working for this business and written a few myself as well um, when I initially joined the business. So um, I hopefully will be able to distill some of that. Uh, knowledge this evening in terms of what goes on when your CV hits certain people, what are they looking for, um, some fairly controversial subjects might be dealt with in terms of how to position your CV and some of the things that happen to your CV which you may or may not know about um, and hopefully that will just add a layer of uh, credibility and reassurance that uh, you, know, you need to do some things differently from how you're possibly doing them right now. Um, importantly the, um, there are going to be a few cliches flying, flying around this evening. One of them is hot skills. Uh, what on earth is a hot skill? Well, they change and evolve over time, but everybody's operating in a particular marketplace, whether you've just graduated or qualified, um, whether you've got 25 years doing something under your belt. Whoever and whatever you're targeting job-wise, career-wise, um, will have expectations. Uh, they'll be looking for certain skills, knowledge, experience. If you know what they are, you can position your CV, which is effectively your core marketing document, however unpleasant a um, concept that might be, in effect you're having to try and sell and market yourself and your services to others. Um, the CV plays a large role in that. If you know what the target audience is looking for um, and you can position your CV accordingly, you will get more interviews and more interest and more attention. The difficulty is knowing what actually people are really looking for. And we'll talk a lot about that this evening. Uh, bottom line is, as I've hinted at, you know, what we'll be talking about this evening, if you were to put it into practice or engage our services to put it into practice, uh, it doesn't matter how it's accomplished. As long as you go to market with a more effective document, you will get more interviews and interest in what you have to offer. So enough about us. Uh, just a little bit more evidence to back up the fact we know what we do and practice works. Um, this on screen right now is a quote from a, or an extract from an email that we got a couple of months back from somebody who'd been through one of these webinars. And we were able to help them. They had been really struggling. Um, they were quite a credible candidate, but they had a truly atrocious CV. I mean, it really was bad. The really sad thing, apart from the fact this person had been thrashing away for three years trying to get somebody interested in them, was that nobody had bothered to tell them. Nobody had actually faced them up and said, do you know what? Joe Bloggs, your CV is rubbish and is letting you down. You need to do something about it. Um, and until we, in fact, passed that news on to them and sorted it, they were none the wiser. They thought it was then. It was a personal thing. It was the economy, the climate, number of applicants. There was all sorts of reasons being flung in the general direction of this particular individual as to why they weren't getting interviews. But the absolute root cause of the problem which will apply to most people this evening if you're struggling to get interviews and attention is the CV you're sending people is in no way relevant to their needs or not relevant enough. And as I say, we're going to talk a bit about, before we get into what you should be doing, a little bit about what you should be looking out for so you can identify whether there's, there's going to be some problems along the way and whether you actually need to consider doing something with your CV. Okay, on that very subject. Um, 
let's have a look at some of the things that perhaps are good warning signs as to whether your CV is going to perform or not in the marketplace. Now, this will be quite easy for people who are actively job seeking right now or have been job seeking fairly recently. It's a little bit harder for people who have yet to put their toe in the water, so to speak, and get active in the marketplace. But let's just take a look at a few things and maybe ask yourself the question of your own CV, whether you fall into any of these categories or traps. Um, comment at the bottom of this particular slide is quite interesting because during these events, normally people start to ask, um, OK, if I follow your guidance or engage your services, what level of increment and success should I expect to see? Um, it's a very subjective area. You can't make guarantees. Nobody can make guarantees to people about what's going to happen. Um, but there is a very strong indicator that if you sort your CV out and you position it well to the people that you're trying to get interest from, we know from our efforts and the feedback we get from our clients that on average people are getting a 30 to 50 percent uplift in the number of interviews they're securing purely by having their CV sorted. Now for some people, that's an average remember, for some people it's dramatically higher. That chap whose email I showed you earlier, um, that was hundreds if not thousands of percent different because literally there was no activity to quite a lot of activity and it was almost overnight. It was that dramatic. Now that person didn't change. Their skills, abilities, knowledge didn't change. Um, they didn't go in with a sort of a new suit or a strange haircut or a better haircut um, or any nonsense like that. that. The person was the same. The message they were sending out to their target audience changed and was subtly different, or not so subtly different as it turned out, but it was certainly more accurate and it was a wholly more effective way of going about things and suddenly they got interviews and attention and interest. Um, but on average, you should expect to see a strong double-digit uplift in interest and interviews. Some of the things that people uh, should use as this sort of test of whether your document is up to scratch or not. Uh, first thing is, um, if in effect all you're sending out to the marketplace, and the marketplace is recruiters, hiring managers, intermediaries, HR folk, whoever it may be, but whoever you're sending your details to, um, who hopefully will be making a judgment on whether you progress further in the job application process or not. If you're just sending them a list of stuff, um, uh, then that's a bad sign. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, most people's CVs, I have to say, at least three quarters of the CVs that I review day in, day out are just lists of facts and figures. Um, and that's not very uh, sexy. Um, whatever your profession and whatever your view on that is, people don't like to get lists of things. Um, so if you're just literally sending a, this is me, my name, this is where I live, this is my education, qualifications, here's a list of jobs I've done, list of duties and responsibilities I've had within those jobs, this is how you can get hold of me, um, and by the way, I'm interested in collecting stamps and going to the cinema. Um, if it's just things like that, that, that's dead easy for lots of people to do. That's what most people do on their CV, and they hope that there's some magic process that goes on within the recruiter or client, employer, uh, where they can see through all of the mist and fog and decide that you're a really strong candidate based on some kind of strange process, magic almost if you like, um, given that all you've done is send them a list of stuff, facts, which aren't very sexy as I say. Now imagine you've bought something recently, if you've bought a car, a house, a domestic appliance, a boat if you're lucky enough. Um, it's highly unlikely you will have bought any of those things purely because somebody gave you or you sourced a list of basic facts and figures. So you're unlikely to have been persuaded to buy a particular brand of car purely because it was a, a couple of meters wide, five meters long, and a meter and a half tall. That, that's unlikely to have prized the money out of your hands. Now, most people go to market with their CV doing exactly that just describing the bare bones facts. So if you're doing that, if all you're sending to people is a list of things and you're hoping that they're going to unravel the mysteries from that and see how really good you are purely based on that CV, it's unlikely that you're being as successful as you'd like to be. So that's, that's warning sign number one. Warning sign number two, which is almost as common a problem, is if you're going to market within effect the same CV format as you've had since you left whatever level of education you left at, so that could be school, college, university, or anything else for that matter, you've formed a CV and all you've done is add to it over time. This is a real problem for people with a career of more than five to seven years roughly, um, but it's also a problem for people who just graduated or qualified, 
and they've picked up somebody's template or peered over the shoulder of a friend or a colleague or had some dodgy advice off the internet about how you should lay out a CV and you think you've done the right thing but actually all you've done is create a bad format that looks like everybody else in the marketplace. We'll, we'll touch on that later. Now, I mentioned hot skills earlier and, and it's rearing its ugly head again. Um, if you don't know what people are looking for in your marketplace, um, and it's the distinct difference between behavioral traits like enthusiasm, dynamism, commitment, passion. Those things are seen by uh, some focused skills, but they have their place and that it's not on the CV. I'll touch on that later as well. Um, so hot skills are things like knowledge, qualifications, um, experience, technical, functional skills. They're the important ones you need to address on the CV. If you don't know what your target audience is looking for, it's highly unlikely, of course, your CVs are aligned to those very skills. Um, so that's a problem. Again, touch on that later. Um, second cliche, I've mentioned it already a couple of times, actually, but target audience, who on earth are they? Well, as I said, it, it's, a, it's a mixture of people, um, and you really need to try and get inside their heads and understand what they're looking for to, to develop a really effective CV. It could be a recruiter. It could be a, a hiring manager within the employer. It could be some outsourced HR facility or combination of all three or more of those types of people. Um, but it's really important you think, what are these folk actually looking for and position your document to that. It's quite hard sometimes, but that, that, that makes a difference between a good or an average CV. At the bottom line to all of this, and probably the most important message that I would say take away from this evening, is that however uh, much you like or dislike this actual concept, I'm afraid the reality is the way to be effective and have a good um, high impact CV is to create not a list of things but actually a business case is what we'd call it, a justification as to why on earth somebody should be bothered to interview you. Forget about the hiring bit, uh, the job offer, that's way down the process. This is getting an interview amongst potentially hundreds of other applicants for a job even at quite senior levels, that's true. How do you convince somebody that they should pick up the phone, send you an email to get you along to a meeting or a telephone interview or some kind of discussion that's going to progress your application, given that there are normally quite a few other people interested in the same opportunity? If you go to market with a strong business case as to why somebody should be considering doing that, you will be more effective. And I can virtually guarantee that. I said there are no real guarantees you build a strong business case, you will be more successful than if you just get to market with a list. So unsurprisingly, bad CV is just a list of stuff. If you feel guilty of that, then you know you can do something about it. A good CV is where it presents a strong business case to your target audience as to why they should be bothering considering interviewing you. Again, think of anything that you've bought. Think of anything if, if, if you're an employee and you had to go to somebody to request funds, money, activity, actions that's, that's needed somebody else's involvement or often financial investment. People aren't just going to hand you over money to do something just because you've said you'd like to do it, or very rarely is that the case. You have to put together a business case as to why somebody should be compelled to give you the money or the time or the resources or the staff or whatever it is to go off and do something. It's the same in the job market. It's a really competitive, cutthroat environment, probably will be for some time to come. You have to stand out for all the right reasons. It's actually quite easy because most people see these are truly hideous, um, and, and that is a, a genuine comment. If you ask recruiters, generally speaking, they'd say 80% of the stuff they receive is way off beam. So the 20% automatically jump much higher up the order, the batting order for the selection for interview. So you just need to be quite high up in that 20% to get the interviews. So the maths is quite simple. 80%, most, most, in most uh, job application phases, 80% of what people receive is either uh, hideously inappropriate or just ineffective and gives the appearance of being inappropriate. The balance are maybe relatively strong looking candidates. And then the recruiters and hiring managers are fishing from that pond, if you like, the 20%, not the 80. The 80 get rejected pretty quickly. So most important message, build a business case. You get more interviews, guaranteed. The acid test, and I have to say, whatever I tell you about your CV, 
whatever anybody tells you about your CV um, and advice they give, the absolute acid test as to whether it's doing its job is, of course, whether it is securing interviews. So um, although uh, there won't be many people, I guess, who are involved in IT in any regard tonight, if you whiz back to the late mid to late 90s, for those of you that were around at that time, you'll be familiar with the infamous Y2K uh, problem that was um, going to cause destruction to the earth as soon as all the system clocks on computers switched over to the year 2000. And huge amounts of money, time, and effort went into trying to resolve and protect computers and systems from that problem. Now, in, in that period of time, if you'd have gone up to a CEO of a business or arrived at the front door of their house and written on a piece of toilet paper, I can solve your Y2K problem and stuffed it through their door or handed it to them, you'd have probably got a phone call if you'd put your phone number on it. Um, you'd have probably got some interest or there would have been a reasonably strong chance of getting some interest. Now, you try doing that now and you'd probably get locked up um, or arrested or quizzed by the police or something of that ilk. It's just not appropriate these days. But the message there is it's all about relativity. It's a very subjective area. If there's a dearth of skills in the marketplace and you have those skills, your CV becomes less important as long as you're mentioning those skills. You know, the technical or the aesthetic performance of your CV is less important. But in a competitive marketplace, and most people are in that right now, where you're getting hundreds, sometimes thousands of people applying for the same job, you don't get much time to get your message across and therefore the acid test of the CV is whether actually it's generating interviews for you. So I would encourage you to think right now, okay, if you're active in the market, you'll have these stats. Or if you're about to go into the marketplace, keep an eye on these stats. Let's imagine you apply for 10 jobs. As long as those 10 jobs are uh, relevant and appropriate, there might be a bit of a stretch for you, that's fine. But as long as you're not going from you know, a solicitor to nuclear submarine captain, in one fell swoop, which clearly is not going to happen however well your CV is written, as long as you're doing something reasonably appropriate and relevant, out of those 10 applications, if you're getting 10 interviews, then it's happy days. There's nothing wrong with your CV. It's doing its job. If, however, you're in the zero interviews, one, two, or three interviews out of the 10 applications, it would suggest that your CV is not quite as appropriate or relevant as it should be. And if you're somewhere in the middle, it's a judgment call. So the bottom line is keep an eye on that stat. It tells you everything you need to know. Ignore comments that you get back from anybody that are wishy-washy along the lines of, uh, it's, there were better people qualified for the role. You're underqualified, you're overqualified. Um, there are a lot of people applying for the role. Or yeah, the, the state of the economy is quite tough. They all sound like plausible reasons as to why you're not getting interviews, but they hide the truth. And the truth is, if you've applied for a job you know you could technically perform and you don't get the interview, the only way somebody's been able to make that decision is because of what you've sent them on your CV or application form. That is the bottom line. Um, and there's virtually no other reasoning. So that's the harsh reality. And if you ask recruiters or if you watch employers make these decisions, often they will say, um, they'll never inform the individual about this, but they will say things like that. There's no way I'm interviewing that person. Their CV is atrocious. It's got nothing to do with the technical abilities of the person. It's got nothing to do with you personally because they don't know you from Adam. It's got everything to do with the message you sent them on a piece of paper or on an email or however you applied for the job. And it's that person's interpretation of what you've sent them that's cost you the interview. Very few people will tell you that, unfortunately. They'll invent all sorts of other reasons that sound very plausible, but they hide the truth, and the truth is CV is not effective. So if you're in that um, bracket or compartment or whatever you want to call it, if you're suffering, you're not getting interviews for jobs you know you could technically perform, do something about it. Um, you know, this really is a really frustrating area for us. That guy whose email I showed you up front uh, of the session, it wasn't his fault as such. Nobody had told him his CV was rubbish until he, he stumbled across us and, and we said to him his CV was rubbish. Um, not pleasant conversation to have, but as soon as he knew that, he could fix the problem and then he starts getting interviews. It's not a big deal, not a big surprise. Um, but the mo most important thing is do something about it. Do not accept all these wishy-washy reasons about why you're not getting interviews. 
if you're in that middle area, if you're getting a four, five, six interviews out of ten applications, you've got to make a judgment call as to whether you do anything or not. It's not that you're in a hideous place, but you're not maybe capitalizing as many interviews or getting as many interviews as you might like. You have to make a judgment call. Ultimately, you then have to look at the stats. How many of the first interviews are going to second interview? How many of the second interviews are going to assessment center or job offer? You have to make a call on whether you've got enough, enough activity to back up what's going on. If you're going to do something about it, then the, uh, there's only really two options. So hopefully an option is not don't do anything unless you're getting lots of interviews. Uh, the two options are you fix it yourself or you get professional help. Okay, let's talk about having analyzed a bit about what you should be looking out for and measuring your own CV and its effectiveness. Once you can look at that, you can then make a decision on what to do. And my recommendation would be if you follow what's on screen now in terms of a, a structure of a CV, then you'll not go far wrong. Now, these are headings at the moment. We're going to interrogate some of these in more detail than others. Um, but this represents a fairly decent structure of a CV. Um, but as with everything, it's the content that's key. Um, so just going to market with these headings and then filling in a load of rubbish is not going to be successful. Um, what you've got to do is get the content right. We'll take a look at that. Um, but I'll go through each of these sections in turn. Um, as I say, some more focused than others, and particularly the top three um, headings or sections are the ones that are really going to focus on because you get these right and I can virtually guarantee it will be the engine behind you getting more interviews um, because these three sections form what I'd call the business case or a large part of it, the vast majority of it. Okay, let's take a look at them in turn. And now what I'm going to do, I'm going to talk about a couple of the sections first, then I'm going to show you um, a real life sample of a CV to show you how it all sort of comes together. Um, if there are any uh, recent graduates or newly qualified folk on board tonight, I've got some more specific CVs that help um, show you how you deal with your situation. I won't have time to go through them right now, but if you want to hang on and um, just flag that up in the, um, the question facility you've got and say, look, recently qualified or I've just, just graduated, how should I approach some of these topics, then I can show you those later. So I'll, I'll, at the moment, I'm assuming that most people have got a reasonable amount of experience under their belt, um, roughly anything more than two years' work experience. Everything I talk about now works, um, and most of it will work for people who've got no experience. It's just you have to think a little bit differently. So most people open up their CV with something, of course. It has to begin something. I guess most people enter uh, their CVs, uh, or let's start with their CV, with the words curriculum vitae at the top of it or their name. Uh, wholly pointless starting with the word curriculum vitae because it's obvious what it is. Don't waste space by telling people it, um, it's something that they already know it is. So your name is the first thing. Um, I'll skip some of the other personal details for now because that's quite important how you deal with things like contact numbers, addresses, bits and pieces. The most important message to get across after who on earth you are, name-wise, is what on earth you are. And that is the professional or executive summary, as we call it. Title's not that important. People sometimes call it personal profile, personal statement, personal summary. Um, doesn't really matter what you call it. As I said earlier, it's the content that drives everything. What you should be doing, I'll tell you a little bit about what most people do, um, and you can then figure out which camp you're in. But what most people do is not what you should be doing. The very first thing you need to be mentioning on your CV is reflecting what on earth you are. If not your specific job title, particularly if it's a bit of a weird or, or um, specialist job title, you need to be telling your target audience, so the recruiter, the hiring manager, the HR person, if they're looking for a solicitor, for example, you need to make sure you're saying that you are a solicitor, not a bubbly, enthusiastic, dynamic individual, um, because that's just inappropriate for reasons I'll come on to later, however bubbly and enthusiastic you may actually be. You need to be saying, if you're in effect, if you, Mr. or Mrs. Recruiter or employer, are looking for X, Y, Z, I am X, Y, Z. It needs to be that clear. Why? Because out of all of those applicants for the job, you'll be surprised how many are totally irrelevant for the job, either because they're not qualified in every sense of the word, 
or any sense of the word, or, or because um, they're at the wrong level, or they're genuinely time wasters, and you'll be surprised how many people are just trying it on. You do not want to be tarred with that brush just because you made it incredibly hard for the reader of your CV to figure out what on earth you are. And don't assume that people will read through your lovely scripted document to page two or page three to unearth where that revelation is. They just won't. If you get um, anything more than 50, 60 applicants for a job as a recruiter, it's incredibly hard to give those people very much time, just under too much pressure. All you're aiming to do is get three to five people for each job to the client for interview, either because you're the sole recruiter or in, you're in a bun fight with uh, tens of other recruiters all trying to hurl CVs at the client. So you're going to get somewhere between five and 30 seconds of somebody's time in that initial filtering process. So this is not a decision on have we got the ideal candidates for the role. This is a decision about have we got people in this pile of applicants that we think we might be able to do something with and then take a little bit more time over and ultimately might interview. So you get five to 30 seconds, somebody will quickly scan the CV and make a judgment. Now bearing in mind, they literally will be seeing, in some cases, welders, bin men, um, all sorts of folks, uh, and, and, and although that may sound um, a bit tongue-in-cheek, it's actually true. If you look at some of the applicants for jobs, however specialist they are, you get all sorts apply. So what we're trying to do is make sure you, you leap off the page for all the right reasons. People reading your CV will instantaneously think this is a relevant, valid applicant for the role, not a potential time waster. That's the key thing. First thing you do to establish that in their minds is describe what you are either in a generic way or some way that's reflecting what the recruiter or employer is actually looking for. Linked to that is the reason why you're on this earth right now. If somebody's going to invest 15, 30, 50, 90, 120,000 pounds a year in you doing whatever you do, what return on that investment can you offer? So again, it's a bit like you know, when you're buying your car or your house or your boat um, or your domestic appliance. You're buying it for a lot of reasons. Some of those reasons are, is, does it make sense to buy? Is it going to give me some kind of return? Is it going to make my life easier? Am I going to be safer driving it? Is it going to save me money on fuel or diesel? There's some propositions lurking there as to why you buy things. And, and it's the same with you as an individual. Why is somebody going to hire you? Because you're going to solve a problem for them. If you appear to be sol solving a problem more effectively or more efficiently than somebody else, offering some value or some insight and some expertise or some knowledge over and above other candidates stands to reason people are going to view you more positively. Talk about a value proposition later and I'll show you an example very shortly. Linked to that, a handful of things that you're particularly good at. Most people tend to have a core set of skills, knowledge, experiences, which are really valuable. Maybe two, three, four things that they're good at. And that all needs to be packaged up and thrown at the target audience, knowing that it addresses some of the hot skills the marketplace is looking for. So um, for certain people, that might be certain legislation or acts or um, legal frameworks that are topical right now and getting a lot of um, high profile attention. Just mentioning those might be a good way of securing a presence in the reader's eye or mind. Here's an example. Um, I won't read it. You can see it for yourselves on screen, but it addresses each of these issues. So what is this person? They're a qualified solicitor. What's the value proposition? Well, it's sort of hovering around this um, specialist area of criminal knowledge and the fact that they seem to be fairly tenacious and successful. Uh, what are they good at? There's a list of things. Is it aligned with hot skills in the marketplace? Well, we have to assume so. We don't know the individual and we don't know the job they're applying for, um, but it seems fairly clear-cut that, that that would appear to address some things that people would be interested in in this person's marketplace. So this would be the text appearing at the top of the CV for this particular individual. It's the first thing anybody reads. It's the uh, key part because it's, it's allowing you to establish that you're a valid candidate for the role. You're not a time waster, um, um, and there's not a whole load of vague stuff in there. Now, what, what, what most people tend to have, if they've got any kind of opening text at all, 
a profile or a personal statement, most people tend to talk about the behavioural things that they think the recruiter is looking for or employer is looking for, and which they probably are, but there's no way on God's earth they're going to judge you based on what you say on your CV. So if you've got a statement and you've got any mention of enthusiasm, commitment, dynamism, interpersonal skills, the absolute classic can work in a team or as an individual. If you've got any of that nonsense in the opening statement of your CV, I guarantee it's not doing any good at all. And um, any self-respecting employer looking to assess for those skills will do it way down the process. They'll have a first interview. They might get a whiff of whether you're enthusiastic and have interpersonal skills. Um, if they really want to assess that, they'll put you through some kind of assessment center to judge it. Um, and the truth is, on most of those things, they won't actually be able to judge whether they've hit the nail on the head until they've actually employed you and you've been there for a couple of months. And then retrospectively, they'll think, yeah, this person truly is an enthusiastic, bubbly, dynamic, committed individual who can work in a team as well as an individual because we've witnessed it with our own eyes. If you write those things on your CV, it makes not the blindest bit of difference. However well you think it makes it sound, it just doesn't. And the trouble is, you look like everybody else who's done exactly the same thing. And the worst situation of all is that if I see a CV that's been sent in to me for review, and I could literally copy the text and, in the most cases, dump it underneath my name, me not being a qualified legal person in any way, shape, or form, but I could still take all of that text, dump it under my name, and actually make a case for all of the things that the person's claiming about themselves, that's surely a huge indicator that something's wrong. I ought not to be able to do that. I certainly couldn't do it with the text that's on screen right now. And most of you probably couldn't. You couldn't claim every single piece of that. You might get close to it, but this statement needs to be virtually unique, a stamp on you as an individual. And most people's are away from that. They're a hugely generic, floppy piece of text which could be used by lots of other people. And that's why a lot of people get rejected. And all they've, all the recruiters done is read the first few seconds and thought, here we go again, reject. It's dead easy for them to do it because they think in their pile of 100 applicants or more that they've got plenty of other fish to, to uh, pick from. Okay, gone on a bit about that, but it's really important. It's the first part of building your business case that I talked about earlier. And it's one of the three key sections I said helped form your business case. I'm not sure, truth be told, if it's the most important part but it's certainly, I mean, all three parts of building a business case are really important. But this is this does set the scene, and, and I've seen CVs being rejected purely because the opening statement was just hideously off beam. Okay, I'll go through the second section of the three, and then I'll show you a real life example, so to speak. So the second section is a really useful area because it gives you the ability to list certain technical and functional skills. And again, I stress that, not behavioral skills. So again, I, I'm not interested in enthusiasm, dedication, commitment, passion, those kind of behavioral traits. Uh, there's no place for them on the CV. What there is a place for, though, is um, you'll be aware that most recruiters, employers will create a job spec or an advertisement that asks for certain technical or functional skills. You need to reflect them on your CV. It's a great area to customize your CV without having to take too long on trying to position it for different roles. It's a great area to aesthetically present things that you've got that the reader of your CV would expect to see, so it'll make them feel warmer and more comfortable towards you as a potential candidate. But it also has the benefit, if you get this section right, it will work really well in the digital world which we live. So as soon as your CV hits a database and people start searching for phrases and keywords, you get this section of the CV right, you will appear more often um, and higher up people's lists. And that's what SEO stands for, by the way, on this slide, search engine optimization. Just a facility that, you know, much like you go onto Google or other search engine and type in something and then a whole list of results appear. Most recruiters have software which does exactly the same on their internal databases. Uh, employers will have the same thing on their application tracking systems or databases, and job boards will have the same thing on their databases. How well people use that technology is a moot point, but if you plan for the fact that most people enter a keyword or phrase or a couple of keywords or phrases to see what's out there, you need to be in that 
um, search criteria. You need to appear as a consequence of people using the technology in its most basic form. This is a great way of achieving that aim. So typically on a CV, we'd literally list a few things like those that are appearing on screen now, just one, two, three, four word top statements, bullet points, typically between 10 and 14 uh, would be a good guideline on the CV. So not too many, but not too few. Um, I'll show you the format shortly, as I say, on a, on a real life CV. Um, but this is a great way of just reflecting back to the target audience what they're actually expecting to see. So it's, this is not a random list of things you think are important. This is a well-controlled list of things you know damn well the target audience is looking for. And them reading it will just make them feel a whole lot more comfortable because most people don't do this. Most people list behavioral traits or skills that they think are appropriate but aren't and they're not relevant. And again, you lose the mind and attention of the reader. Get this right, and after having just written a really compelling opening statement, then they see that you've got all the technical and functional skills they're also looking for, or at least a good section of them. Again, it just adds to that nice, warm, fuzzy feeling about you as a potential candidate. Note at the bottom of this slide in red is really simplistic but critically important, and I hinted at this earlier. Um, and it's that the vast majority of recruiters and hiring managers can only make a decision about who to interview based on your CV and the contents of it. And, and, and I suppose most people think, well, of course, that's true. But there's such an important point lurking there, which is this. If you talk to individuals about the process and say, OK, here's your CV. Here's the job. You've not mentioned X, Y, and Z, where clearly it would appear that you've got those skills, but you've not mentioned them. You've got the experience. You've not mentioned them. You've done some really good work in these areas in this field, or you've got a particularly good area of knowledge in a particular field of expertise, but you've not mentioned it on your CV. Typically, people say, yeah, but at interview, I'd talk about it. I'd fill in all the gaps. And then we say, OK, well, how many interviews have you had? Oh, none yet. Mm, OK, interesting. What people tend to do on their CV is they put, they're too close to it, too familiar with it. A lot of people undervalue what they've done or forgotten about what they've done or don't know what the target audience is actually looking for. So they think what by they'll put the bare bones on their CV. And when they get this opportunity to talk to people, they'll fill in all the gaps, not recognizing that they're not actually getting that many opportunities to do exactly that. And then you say, well, how do you think the recruiter is going to know all of these things if you don't put them on your CV? Um, oh, well, I'm not really sure. And, and there's just some. There is no crystal ball. You know, recruiters get a hard time for certain things. Employers sometimes do as well. It's not always easy to guess what they're actually looking for, um, but it's not that hard either, given a bit of effort and work. If, if you're not giving them the information to make the decision, there is no other way they can find it out, unless you get lucky and you get called to interview, of course. But for a lot of people who get rejected, the reason they get rejected is because their CV doesn't address the issues of the target audience and they never get the opportunity to fill in the gaps. And nobody ever tells them the reason why you didn't get the interview was because your CV didn't prove to me or give me enough evidence to support why I should interview you. And so the, the cycle goes on. So it's absolutely critical that you put down everything that the reader would expect to see on your CV and don't leave anything to their assumption or imagination because they don't have the power or the abilities or the mystic capabilities to fill in those gaps on your behalf. For the mathematicians amongst you, the difference between all recruiters and hiring managers, i.e. 100% and the 92%, is down to people who are known to the individual's concern. So there are some recruiters who will know you, for example, or know of you, and there'll be some circumstances where your name might be mentioned to the recruiter and you're selected for interview because of that rather than the CV. And of course, although if that's the case, that's great. That can add a lot of value. But for most people, it's solely down to the CV as to whether you get interviewed or not. OK, so we've talked about the two uh, out of three really important areas of the CV, the opening statement and then the key skills. These are really important parts of forming this business case that I keep waffling on about, but which is the core to getting more interviews and more success in the job market. Let me show you a, a real life example, which I've been promising. So this is um, actually of uh, um, the guy that runs our business, Matt. Um, 
it, so it's, it's non-legal at this moment in time. As I have to say, I've got a couple of legal CVs. I don't have time to show them because they're, um, they are real CVs of people which I've tried to anonymize. 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 Uh, it's getting too late. <coughs> and um, I don't want to focus too much time and attention then because they are very specific and every CV is bespoke, of course, by definition. Um, and um, I will show you, for those that are interested after the session is completed, I'll show you, I've got a graduate example and I've got somebody who's got a bit of experience under their belt um, and handled some particular cases in a particular niche area, just to give you a flavour of on the legal side. But the format that you're looking at right now is exactly the same as we'd write for pretty much anybody. And it deals with the two sections we've talked about so far. So the opening statement, so in this case, Matt, who runs our business, what is he? It's clear. What's his value proposition? It's all about driving interview and job offer rates. Uh, what's he good at? There's a list of things. Is it aligned to the hot skills in his marketplace? Yeah, we have to assume that it is. Then bullet points. Key areas of expertise that Matt can offer his target audience, his marketplace, their technical or functional skills, and every single one of them, if necessary, could be proven later on in the CV. And that's a really good question to ask yourself. Read your CV, particularly the opening statement, and any skills you're attributing to have, and ask yourself the question, can I or have I proven these things later on in the CV? And this is where the behavioral ones are really interesting, because if you can prove how enthusiastic you are on a piece of paper, um, I will send you money right now. If you can prove how dedicated you are, and particularly how, how how can you prove that you're more or less enthusiastic than anybody else applying for the job? You definitely need to win an award. Um, how can you prove that you can work in a team or as an individual on a CV? You can't. How can you prove that you, you've got great interpersonal skills on a CV? You can't. So there's no point in making reference to them. Um, and it might sound a bit controversial because most people do exactly that, but if you ask the employers, it just goes straight over their heads. They'll they'll judge that at a later stage in the process. So that's the first two sections. Lurking beneath on Matt's CV, you'll see the third of the three areas that are really important to building the business case. So we'll come on to that um, right now. Um, and it's an area called career highlights, or if you're practicing, uh, notable cases could be a good um, heading and populated with certain information. So um, when we're working with people um, within the legal profession, we have to make a decision about you know, what, if you're in an administrative support role, it's career highlights 99 times out of 100. But if you're a practicing solicitor um, and you've actually done some case work, then we have to think a little bit more about the, uh, the, the definitions and what the content is, because it depends a little bit on what you're trying to do and what experience you've got under your belt to prove that. But if you view it as being either career highlights or notable cases, that's a good good, good place to start. Now, if you're being harsh about the CV that I've shown you already and what I've been talking about, although I've hinted at the fact we can demonstrate and prove claims that are being made on the CV, this is the area that does it, because up till now, they have been claims. So whether it was Matt's CV or that fictitious solicitor that I showed you earlier, there were some claims about what they are, what their value proposition is, what they're good at, um, and some key skills being bullet pointed. And you could say, okay, where's the proof? This is the area where you start to prove it, which is why it's so important. Again, most people's CVs, not everybody's, but most people's CVs don't have enough evidence on them, not enough proof. Lots of statements, lots of buzzwords, lots of look at me, but not enough proof. Two things that we do here when we're writing CVs for our clients. Um, it is imperative that you can write reasonably well. Um, because as you'll see, uh, you're trying to condense maybe quite complex cases or events in your life into a fairly concise piece of text. Second thing is we use a methodology called STAR. Um, lots of these things exist and acronyms of similar ilk. Um, this stands for Situation, Task, Actions, Result. It's a really good way of writing concise text on a particular complicated subject. Um, it's also a really good way of dealing with competency-based questions. If you get good at this verbally, it's a really good way of being able to structure an answer to a competency-based question if asked one. 
here's an example. Uh, so again, I'm not going to read it, you can see for yourselves, but the first sentence of this paragraph of, of a case study, a career highlight if you like, the proof to give some substance to claims being made on your CV, the first sentence is normally the situation, the scene setter if you like, the what on earth was going on, uh, not in loads of detail of course, but enough for somebody to look at it and think, okay, I understand. The second sentence is normally the task. So. What responsibility rested on the shoulders of this particular individual in this particular situation? Then there's a list of actions, which tend to be the bulk of the remaining text, things that were done to progress the situation. And then normally the final sentence or close to as the result or outcome. So in this case, you can see this person's fairly senior level, um, given a task, did a number of things to affect that task and succeeded in saving quite a lot of money and delivering benefit that could be attributed to a large sum of money. Now, this of course only works with people with some kind of experience, but I guarantee um, if you've got at least, uh, I'd say, a year or two's worth of experience doing anything, um, then everybody can write something like this about whatever they've been doing and can structure it in a way to provide the evidence to support why somebody should be interested in you or interested in interviewing you. If you're a graduate, I'll show you later, but you, 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 can't, you can't obviously talk about career because you've not yet had one if you've just graduated. But what you can do is flip it slightly, um, which is why I said every, every CV is bespoke. There's always a way around these things. You're still trying to biz, build a business case. doesn't matter whether you've got any real work experience or not or a career to speak of. That's not the issue. What you can do is build a case as to why somebody should be interested in interviewing you. Um, and if you've got anything about you, you'll have probably done some other things in your life. You'll have done extracurricular activities. You may have done some part-time jobs. They will have equipped you with competencies of some description that are being sought by your target audience. And if you're a recent graduate, your target audience is just different. You're in a pool of lots of people, but I guarantee most of those people will be going to market with a very bland Me Too CV, which leads with their education and all the things they've just invested a huge chunk of time, effort, and money in but actually aren't the most differentiating thing about them as an individual. The most differentiating thing about most people is what they've actually done to demonstrate competencies or experience in some way or other. And that can be done via these career highlights, or if you're a graduate, some kind of competency matrix, or if you're a qualified solicitor and actually practicing notable cases. Typically on a CV, for particularly with anybody, for anybody in a support role um, or a non-legal career in terms of um, uh, practicing law with casework experience, three strong career highlights would be sufficient. With caseworks, you can go more. You can actually have quite a lot to give a flavour and example. As I say, if anybody's interested in looking at a CV that's a little bit more specifically focused towards that sector, I'll show you one later after the session's done. So as I say, three of these on a CV is enough to make most people think, great, this person has demonstrated an ability to do something that I'm interested in paying them some money for. And it almost is a case of hallelujah, at last somebody has bothered to give me the evidence that I crave for. And if any of you have ever worked in the public sector particularly, although some large scale private sector employers do it already, and you've ever had to fill in an application form for a job these days, uh, typically on the internet of course, you'll probably notice that in a lot of cases, these application forms force you to provide evidence of your ability to do something. Um, normally with a, please explain in less than 500 words, or please explain in up to 2,000 characters, a time when you had to do this, or an experience you had which demonstrated that. And you have to write something, and it feels all awkward because you're thinking, well, why are they asking these silly questions? And the truth is, they're asking them because the CVs they get are so hideous normally, um, keep using that word, but I'm afraid I'm tainted by experience, uh, but genuinely most employers get fed up with just seeing this me too kind of template mentality. They crave evidence. That is why the application forms force you to have to provide evidence of certain abilities. Um, and then it gives the employer or recruiter or HR people an opportunity to judge people. The NHS do this now all the time. It's almost pointless having a CV in the NHS because they force people to 
uh, fill in application forms and then they make their judgment based on that and in fact they actively discourage people to send in the CV and that's only through their bitter experience of receiving so many rubbish CVs. Word of caution though on some of these highlights, a um, couple of things that are sort of linked. Um, when people try this themselves or they think, yeah, I've got achievements on their CV, often they're too weak or they appear to be too weak because there's not enough detail. There is a fine line. You can't write war and peace. Of course, people aren't interested in that. Um, but you can't just put a couple of lines saying, um, significant achievement when I did this, full stop. It's not enough. Um, it tends for people to think, is this really an achievement? Are people just saying this? It's all sorts of strange things going on in the reader's mind. So there's a fine line between enough information to get the message across but not too brief as to make people suspicious. Another thing is people tend to pick the wrong examples when they have a go at this themselves. They pick what they enjoyed the most rather than what's most relevant to the target audience. So it's a, that's a hard lesson to learn, but you've got to pick examples that are relevant to the folk that you're uh, sending your CV to, not things that you enjoyed the most necessarily. If the two are combined, well then again, happy days. But often people pick the things they like the most but that aren't relevant. Not everybody can find an example where they sort of change the world um, and you ought not to worry too much about that. It all depends on the role you perform. If you're in a role that's responsible for billing and earning fees with clients, then you'd be expected to give examples of that. So the KPI, the key performance indicators, are important if you're measured on them already. But if you're an administrative or support role or a recently qualified individual or a graduate, it's unlikely you're going to be able to demonstrate, as I say, the fact that you've changed the world, saved people hundreds of thousands of pounds and done all these wonderful things. But that's not the point. The target audience probably wouldn't expect you to have done any of those things. What they want to see is evidence of the things that you have done <coughs> that differentiate you from your competition. And this is where we spend probably most of our time with our clients trying to unearth these things and put them through some kind of sanity check um, because that is important. Okay, let's just briefly look at Matt's CV again to show you how that sort of goes together structurally. So I'll just reduce the magnification. So, <coughs> excuse me. Um, these three sections are the three sections that form the business case on your CV. Opening summary, we talked about the bullet point key skills, we talked about the career highlights, we've just talked about three of them. It's good enough for most CVs. There's a reason for the three. Three is the magic number because it also determines how long the CV will be, critically the first page. Um, it allows, uh, we can't see it yet, but it allows Matt and anybody else for that matter the space to make sure they get onto page one who they currently are working with or most recently worked with, which is really important. But that's the area uh, that gives you the, uh, if you like, the horsepower to get more interviews. Get that bit right, you can virtually guarantee people will be more interested in you as an individual. Get it wrong, of course, and, and you can guarantee that people will just treat you like most other candidates, which is, okay, where's the evidence, where's the proof, why, why should I, I be interested in interviewing this individual? So that's the key bit. We're going to talk briefly now about some of the other sections because they are important. And of course, interestingly, um, again, eagle-eyed amongst you will will observe we still not actually said where Matt's working. So that's another clue. If you've got a CV that opens up with almost immediately, this is where I'm currently working, and here's my work history or professional experience or whatever you want to call it. Again, that's a warning sign. Um, you lose control of the document then. If you're too quick to tell people where you're currently working, you have no idea, um, or most people have no idea, how that will be interpreted. What pictures are conjured up in the reader's mind when they find out you're working for XYZ PLC? If you're lucky, they'll think, yeah, great organization. They always hire strong people, so they must be all right. There are not many people in that position. Though. Most people work for businesses that nobody else, else has ever heard of. So. If, if that's your message, is that really what you want to lead your CV with? Is that how you want to differentiate yourself by telling somebody you work for a company that nobody else has ever heard of? Not particularly clever. So don't open up with employment history as almost the first thing. Ditto education, which a lot of people do. 
um, even if you're a recent graduate, your qualifications are probably not the most differentiating thing you have to offer. There are hundreds of people with good degrees, there are quite a few people with first, there are quite a few people with um, the next stage into your legal qualifications. So on paper, you don't appear to be that different from lots of other folk. What differentiates you is the stuff that I've talked about so far, which is why it's on the top of page one of the CV. What have you actually done? What are you capable of doing? Where's the proof and the evidence to back it up? However, we do at some stage have to talk about where on earth you've been working if you have a career of any nature. Um, we call that the career history section. Unsurprising, it doesn't really matter what you call, call it. Um, it's the content that's key. So for anybody with a reasonable career, let's say more than 10 years old, you put a reasonable amount of detail about your current most recent jobs. There are, again, this is a, an area which we have to debate and discuss with individuals on a case-by-case -case basis. But typically, as a guideline, you want to be looking at some detail for the last eight to 10 years. So not much further back than the turn of the millennium for most people. Folk won't be interested. In terms of selecting you for interview, they won't really give a damn what you were getting up to in the 90s, the 80s, the 70s, or even the 60s for some people. It just won't have a, in fact, it's probably damaging you more than it's helping you. Whether that's right or wrong is neither here nor there. It just happens. So focus on the last eight to 10 years. I'll deal with the time before that where it's appropriate soon. Um, but that's where the detail should be. You'll be hired or interviewed on the basis of what you've done most recently and certainly within that period of time. For the roles, um, and for most people, you'll probably, I guess, have done less than four separate jobs. So that's the other reason why eight to 10 years works, because it allows you to talk about possibly one, two, three, normally for most people, tops four roles in that time period. If you've got more than four roles within the last 10 years, you need to have a think about that in terms of how much detail you go into. Um, but again, that's a devil in the detail conversation. But broad indicator, last eight to 10 years of your career, or last four jobs, up to last four jobs, you provide some scope, scale, background. You know, who on earth is the company you're working for? What are they doing? What are they about? How many people do they employ? Turnover, if that's relevant, areas of specialist, um, expertise or knowledge, just enough for people to think, oh, okay, yeah, I understand the context of where this person's working. Don't assume that they'll dig that up themselves, they won't. A um, bit about your role, so what are you expected to do, duties and responsibilities, yes, but the balance, and the bigger balance, what have you actually done with those duties and responsibilities, or cases that you've been involved with? So the proof, the evidence to back up what makes you different? Lots of people have the same duties and responsibilities. It's what you've done with them that makes the difference. That needs to be the focus of the CV and the focus of each job that you've done in the last uh, eight, 10 years, roughly. As far as the earlier career, and I'll, again, I'll show you uh, Matt's case um, on Matt's CV shortly. As far as the earlier career, so if you have a career that um, I don't know, started in the 70s, 80s, or 90s, um, that part, that earlier part of your career, really just needs to be abbreviated. It buys you a lot of space. People aren't generally interested in it in terms of selecting you for interview. Unless they've specifically asked for detail, you don't need to provide it. So it's just a line, literally, from this date, 1992, to that date in 1995. This was the company or firm. This was my job title. End of. That simple. Anyone wants to debate or dispute that, I'm more than happy to take questions in the forum. Um, not many people do, in fairness, um, and, and, and it's not normally a contentious issue. But I'd be surprised how many people's CVs I see who still go into loads of detail about what they were doing over 20 years ago. It's just not relevant. Unless somebody specifically asks you, that's not going to get you the interview. Then we follow the career section with qualifications, professional development, um, and such like. Now, if you've got a specific level of qualification, academic or professional, the headline news can be incorporated into the professional summary that we saw on page one of the CV. So for example, I forget the gut word, it was a, 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 such and such, four and a half years qualified solicitor, or whatever the terminology was, or if you're a recent um, graduate, or or um, yeah, graduate with a couple of years' experience, you could say you know, a, a law graduate with blah, 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 
um, you can incorporate the headline news about the academic or professional level of qualification you have in your professional summary without giving the detail. As I said earlier, the detail of your education is not normally a strong enough differentiator. Um, there are lots of other people normally with a similar level of education and development behind them. So you don't leave with that on your CV. Consequently, we always put the qualifications at the detail stage anyway towards the back of the CV. Um, if people are bothered about the levels and the, uh, and the results, they'll want to look for them. They'll want to look for that evidence. It won't bother them. They've got to turn the page. Ditto personal details, and this is normally a little bit more uh, controversial. Most folk tend to open up name, address, um, in some detail, contact details, email address, um, sometimes date of birth. You don't need to do that. Uh, it could harm you again for all the wrong reasons, but unfortunately it could harm you both whether it's too early or too late. Um, yeah, marital status, family, hobbies, interests, none of that makes any difference to getting an interview. And in fact, there's some evidence to suggest that putting your personal details first, again, it might harm you, you might be a victim of a postcode lottery. Yeah, employer or recruiter says, nah, this person, they're not going to tolerate that commute, you might be up to it. Um, without, we're not going to offer a relocation and my, my suspicion is this person lives too far away from the job, so I'm going to reject them. Um, probably won't tell that to your face, but that might be the reason. Don't give people evidence that um, could cause you harm. So our recommendation is the only thing you have on the front of the CV, as you saw on Matt's example, is name, a couple of contact details, get into the meat of the CV. Leave all the boring stuff about where you live, with all due respect to wherever you live, until much later in the CV. It's not the differentiator you'd want it to be, necessarily. And then the other classic that we have on CVs is uh, references available on request, which again is an ultra bad habit. It's not, it's, not in, it's, it's not the crime of the century. But what does it tell anybody? Um, it tells them that you've got references available on request. Well, big deal. Most employers, well, they'll seek references whether you've got them available on request or not. They will seek them, but much later on in the process. You will not get an interview based on the fact that you've got the words references available on request on your CV. That, that just doesn't happen. Um, you won't not get an interview by removing them from your CV. Far more powerful testimonial evidence. For those of you who've got uh, professional networking profiles um, and have collected any recommendations, dead easy to copy and paste a couple of them on your CV. For those that um, don't have that information um, on the internet but maybe have some good evidence on email, reprisals, feedback from previous managers, if you've got it, really useful on the CV, wholly more productive than sticking references available on request. Wholly more productive than putting people's names and addresses if you have them, um, because uh, unless you've been asked to put them on your CV, it's just wasting space. So really useful to put those on. And then finally, again, slightly controversially, I suppose, uh, we tend not to reflect people's hobbies and interests unless they materially affect your business case. So uh, you need to be very careful about hobbies and interests because you just don't know how the other party in the process will receive the information you're providing them. Uh, it could go a number of ways with people. I mean, you might get lucky, and if you supported a particular football team, um, the person to the other side of the table might enjoy the same team. And then, okay, no, no harm done. But there are certain rivalries which you probably want to, wouldn't want to uh, get in the way of being considered as an applicant and they shouldn't get in the way, but you'd be surprised sometimes what comes up in people's minds when they think of you as an individual because of who you support, what you follow, what your interests are. You also don't want to give away too much. If, you're, if, you, if, you, if you have said on your CV that you're a team player, not that I think that's a good thing to say, and then all your hobbies and interests are insular and introverted or could be perceived as such, what does that tell you? you know, somebody might make a big deal about that. It's just not worth the effort. So the only reason we put a hobby and interest on the CV is if it materially helped build the business case. could be an interest in an area that you're claiming to have a specialism in, um, or you might not have the experience um, per se in a particular area, but you're really interested in it outside of work and you can prove that, that might be relevant. But in all other cases, probably avoid. Okay, um, brief moment of reflection. Um, firstly, um, Hopefully I've gone through enough information now for you to know whether you, oh, you'll either know that you'll have the statute. If you're active in the market, you'll know whether you're getting enough interviews or not. 
so you can answer that question. Um, if you're not active in the marketplace yet, but you're going to be, you're probably getting a few clues now as to how far away your CV is from the ideal, or wh whatever ideal is. Um, and what I'd encourage you to do when you get into the marketplace is either fix the problem ahead of that, or you get really um, aggressive on measuring the stats. And whatever you apply for, follow that acid test rule. If you're not getting an interview for something you know you can perform, that means there's something wrong with your CV, almost certainly. And if that's the case, it's because you're not building a business case. Now, we've talked a lot this evening about building the business case, um, just getting that CV sentiment sorted so that whoever picks it up think, hmm, this person we should take seriously, first of all, and there's enough evidence here to suggest they could perform the role. They probably should be somebody we interview. And if you analyze why people don't build their business case effectively, it's because there's not enough evidence on the CV to support the claims that they're either making or the target audience would expect to have made on it. Now, let's take a look at Matt's CV um, before we then wrap things up. <coughs> Excuse me. So just briefly, um, what you see on screen now is all of page one. So right at the bottom, there's the career history bit that I started talking about just. Um, fairly traditional in the sense of who on earth is Matt working for, what is his role, the dates, but a little explanation, not much, just enough for people to say, okay, yeah, this company which I've never heard of before, now I understand at least what marketplace they're in roughly. I can see Matt's role, he's beginning to explain what he does. And if we flip on to page two, now bear in mind this, this is always different for people, it's the, the balance of the content the kind of things we're talking about are, are always different. But because Matt's been at this particular business for some time, there's quite a lot of information about this particular role, how he fits in, what team has he got working for him, what's he expected to be doing, and then achievements, assignments, evidence of his ability to deliver. Now, for a solicitor, this would be lots of casework, lots of notable cases, cases would apply here. If you're an admin or support role, uh, it'd be just lots of things that you've done that demonstrate why you're good at what you're doing. Things that it would be hard for other people to copy. Then base of page two, uh, interestingly we'll talk about number of pages on the CV later, um, uh, but briefly but later. Um, bottom of page two, got an earlier role for Matt, um, and, um, and then if we flip to page three, you can see his earlier career is abbreviated. Now, interestingly, um, again, sharp-eyed amongst you will, might have noticed that one of the career highlights that Matt had uh, on page one of his CV was from an earlier part of his career at Enterprise Rent-A-Car. Now, that, that career highlight that he talked about using the STAR methodology, there was no reference to date or time in that. Um, so somebody could work it out, of course, but the beauty of that is that if you have got a reasonably long career, and you're currently trapped in the chronological time trap, if you like. Of you can only talk about the good things you did in 1992 when you get to 1992 on your CV, and that's on page three or four of your CV, and therefore nobody will ever see it. This gives, those career highlights are a great way of bringing forward relevant, appropriate experience, but getting it on the front of your CV. So there's all sorts of little tricks you can play to make sure that that business case is as strong as it needs to be, irrespective of when you accumulated the experience. And then in Matt's case, we've got a bit about education, his personal details, and that testimonial area, the recommendations, which is really important. Now, because everybody's different, if you've got particular technical skills, um, particular um, knowledge, any published material, any casework, you could, you could add or subtract from this, this kind of structure accordingly. So I'm just, you know, stressing what you see in front of you is a way of doing it for an individual. The front bit, the business, building the business case is nearly the same for everybody, but of course the content, how much information you give about your jobs, how far you go back, um, whether you expand on any particular technical or legal skills or knowledge you have, that can all be dealt with as per required for the individual to help build the business case. Okay, let's just quickly talk a few other bits and pieces before moving on. Um, I've hinted now quite a few times that you should be able to either assess how you're doing in the marketplace or begin to think how you might do in the marketplace um, when you hit it with your current CV. 
Um, and if, if you're starting to think, mm, okay, I'm, I'm not sure this is going to work out, or actually, I've got the stats, I've been told a whole heap of rubbish about what's going on in the marketplace, the bottom line is my CV is not working, then as I hinted at earlier, the only people who should be doing nothing about that are those that are actually getting a healthy level of interviews. And if you're happy with the level of interviews you're getting, then fine, that's great. If your CV is doing its job. If you're happy with that, then, then you shouldn't need to do anything. But for everybody else, you've got to do something and let's either fix it yourself following the instructions that we've talked about this evening and the guidelines, or you seek help. And obviously, we're able to do that. And um, shortly, when we wrap this thing up, because we're just overrunning a little bit now, um, there's some really big discounts that uh, you get as a consequence of attending this webinar through Totally Legal um, if you begin to think, mm, actually, I need to get some help with this. Finally, um, just to wrap up on a few bits, I won't do well on each of these, um, but I promised I'd deal with a number of pages and a couple of other bits and pieces. Uh, the uh, tense of the CV is quite important. You might have noticed on Matt's example, there's no reference to Matt other than his name. He doesn't say Matt did this, Matt did that, and there's no I did this and I did that. Written in the third person. Spelling's really important. Um, about a quarter of the CVs I review still have spelling or grammatical errors on them. They are a good enough reason for instant rejection, however good a candidate you may be. So be really tight on the spelling. Uh, number of pages, a bit of an urban myth about that. Um, there is no real need to go to market, unless you've specifically been asked to submit a document on X number of pages. The market is not demanding of a certain length of CV. There is no evidence to support that. Most CVs we write for our clients who've got a career of more than 10 years probably are three pages long. Nobody's ever come back to us and said, you're a bunch of idiots. You've given me a document that's three pages long. The market demands two pages. I want my money back. Never happened. Um, what does happen is people get really fed up of receiving rubbish, whether it's on one, two, three, or four pages. And that sort of got misinterpreted over time as being the way we can help restrict the amount of paper we have to wait for is to ask for a shorter CV because we'll just get the rubbish on a shorter space, a shorter amount of um, paper, less paper. Uh, and that, that's sort of where it's come from. There are some people who still say, oh, we must have a CV on such and such a number of pages, but you, that'll be announced ahead of time. So you react accordingly, of course. But in most cases, people, if it's good, compelling content, they won't give a damn whether it's on one, two, three, or even four pages, truth be told. If you're thinking about getting help, i.e. the seek professional help rather than the DIY, um, uh, some people have already asked this question. I can see um, I'll deal with it now, and then if I don't have to replicate it um, in the, um, the uh, question and answer session to follow. Uh, so very briefly, if you're interested in considering that, then the way it works is that you know, we don't amend people's CVs. We're not here to tweak and refine. It's a complete root and branch review of the CV and a rewrite. Um, you can't amend things. They either work or they don't work. And if they don't work, they need sorting out. And that's what we do. The way we do it is we collect all the data we need from you during a telephone conversation or a Skype conversation or whatever it needs to be. Um, fairly intensive, fairly cathartic in a strange kind of a way. But we get all the data out of you that we need. And we help actually add a bit of value as well. So if, you, if you're trying to aim in a particular career direction, if it's maybe a bit of a stretch, we can help with that in terms of how you should position yourself, the information you need to get across to your target audience. So it's not just writing a CV. It's making sure that you, you know what you need to do to get to that level that you aspire to. And if you don't already know what your value proposition is, and a fair few people don't genuinely, they, they, they're not really clear on that. We'll help with you. We'll define that and, and work out how you should be going to market. Build up all the evidence we need to write your career highlights um, or notable cases. So ultimately, you, you get your business case sorted. So what you go to market with becomes a whole lot more compelling. And if that's true, that's the bit that will get you more interviews. So if that's a problem for you right now, that bit can be solved. But the interesting fact lurking behind that is that it can also get you access to a bigger role. So if you're struggling because people are pigeonholing you into a particular area right now, and you're trying to elevate yourself from that, as long as we know that, when we write the CV, we can position it to get you access to talk the language that that, purse, that target audience is expecting to see for that level, that heightened level of role. It's quite a successful tool at 
getting people higher up the ladder. And if all of that's true, then you can do the maths. You can work out whether that's worth investing in or not, because I'm afraid it does cost money. Um, so DIY costs you a bit of time um, and investment. Um, but if you're not interested in that and you think can't be bothered, then yes, we can help. That bit does unfortunately cost money. But at least you can work out whether it's a worthwhile investment. Because if you can get a better job quicker, that's worth something. If you can get a bigger job um, when you've been struggling to do so, that's worth something. But as I've stressed a number of times, if you're struggling getting interviews, do something. Whatever you choose to do, please do something because that will make the difference. So finally, what we can do for you in terms of uh, choices, there are three main choices um, and benefits that you get as a result of enduring this, um, this webinar. Um, if you wanted to use a professional service to sort out your CV, um, your professional networking profile online if you have one or want to have one, the two main choices are firstly, do you want to speak with a human being and go through that consultative process? Um, there's some benefits, and it really applies to people. If anybody got more than roughly seven years' work experience, I a decent career, it almost certainly makes sense because we can add a lot of value. It costs a bit more money, of course, but it uh, is worth the investment, generally speaking. And instead of uh, 379 quid plus VAT that our standard prices would be, if you're interested in that service, CV, LinkedIn profile, cover letter, you get for 275 plus VAT a substantial discount off our rate card prices. If you're a bit more junior than that, you've got less experience or that's a bit too much money and you're happy to work with a questionnaire rather than speak to a CV writer over the phone, then we can operate a system via questionnaire um, where you complete it, give us the details and then we'll write the CV based on that. Uh, that means we can bring the cost down. It works particularly well for people who have just graduated who've got little work experience or who've been in a job, the same job for a long period of time and haven't switched jobs and are not, not looking to do anything radically different with their career. And then we can do all of the things, again, I've said, for 175 plus VAT. So the difference, the, the, the couple of hours spent on the phone is the difference in the price, basically. That's, that's the choice you have. And finally, if you do want to have a go at something yourself, um, but you wanted a bit of guidance, a bit of a sort of toe in the water, so to speak, a bit of help. We do a um, what we call a post-webinar pack, like a DIY kit with a few templates, uh, e-booklets to give you a bit of a helping hand. Um, and that's a, a fairly modest uh, 20 quid plus fat, less a penny. Now, in all of those cases, apart from the fact that they cost money, there's also a, a time limit, I'm afraid. You know, these deals are massive discounts off our normal prices. Um, but we're talking to a large audience, lots of people interested in these services normally, so we can afford to do it, but we do time limit them. So you've got until midnight, uh, or close of play, Friday 25th, this Friday, to make a decision and place your order. Whether you use the service now or later is entirely up to you. You can book the, book the service, store it for a month, two months, or even have somebody store it for 12 months for some unearthly reason, but that's their choice. So you can pay your money, make your choice, and then reserve the service whenever you want to use it. It could be next week or it could be two months away. That's up to you. Um, but whatever you do, you need to visit this website. And I will put into the um, uh, question facility um, the um, website thing that uh, we need to click on because I don't think you can click on it from there. So just bear with me um, and I'll grab that. Um, and paste it for you. And then I'll move on to um, the questions and answer session. Okay, on the screen there should be now for most people that website that you need if you're interested. And that will take you to a landing page um, which will look um, a bit like this. There you go. So if anybody clicks on that link, you'll go to a page that looks like that. You can select your choice and then take it from there, just so you know that you've landed in the right place and it's all legit. Okay, that's it for this session uh, as far as the main content's concerned. Um, so I thank you for your time. I hope you got something out of that and find it useful. 
um, and I appreciate the time you've put in this evening. Um, I promised I'd deal with questions. Um, uh, for those that need to disappear, obviously disappear, but if you'd like to listen to the answers to the questions, I will answer everybody's questions as promised. Um, if you just bear with me, um, I've just got to flick a few switches and then I'll work through the questions in chronological order. Um, if you've got any questions right now you want to ask, there's still time to jump on and um, ask a question and I will deal with it in order. Um, so um, 